Hello, and welcome to the Homemade Camera Podcast. Today we're here with David Miller and Ben Hoffman, two industrial design students, or I guess they're not students anymore, but they were when they contacted me, uh, what, four or five months ago, and asked me what I thought about homemade cameras, and I basically razzed them on uh, Google Meets <laughs> for about an hour or two way back then, uh, and uh, made fun of industrial design at nausea, <laughs> and then um, they went away and uh, did their thesis and built and designed many homemade cameras that I thought were incredibly cool and learned a thing or two uh, from these guys. And so I asked to have them on the show and see if they would talk about what they did. So um, that's what we're going to do today. So uh, David and Ben, welcome to the Homemade Camera Podcast. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Great to be here. <laughs> here, Come for here, here, yeah. here is. Um, so let's get started before we get into your your uh, crazy paper on cameras. Um, who are you guys? Where, where are you from? Um, I guess I'll go first. So uh, my name is Ben Hoffman, as you introduced us. Um, and both of us were industrial design students at the University of Cincinnati. Um, in di industrial design, for those of the podcast listeners who might not know what that is, is kind of like product design, like any, basically anything that you're going to buy is probably designed by someone and we're there to make sure it looks good, works well, and it can be made. Um, I guess I found like photography pretty young. Um, I kind of dug up my grandfather's Practica uh, 35 millimeter made in, uh, what was it? Yeah, I think it's like um, the Soviet side of, uh, of Germany, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. some fun Eastern European cameras. Um, and I guess that's kind of like what sparked my love for it. And I, since then was like tearing apart cameras and everything. And uh, I guess like that paired with um, the field of industrial design. So like something that I went into being like a nice marriage of like your creative aspects of many things with like a little bit more pragmatic, like engineering side of things. I like to joke that we do all of like the fun parts of engineering. Um, <laughs> So like, it seemed like a good match for the thesis project. And uh, me and David have uh, been pretty long-term friends throughout college and share many of the similar interests. So like and, you introduced yourself. You both from Indiana? No, I'm um, from, I, yeah. Right. He's from Indianapolis. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. So we met, we met in college actually. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm David Miller, like Ben mentioned. Um, and yeah, we've known each other since freshman year of college, but not before that. We grew up in, in different places, both in the Midwest, but uh, both went to the University of Cincinnati and um, have not been able to get rid of each other since then. Uh, <laughs> we've we've been um, we've we've lived together like about four or five times throughout college, um, a couple times by choice and uh, a few other times by necessity. And um, <laughs> over the course of that, um, have gotten to be super, super close. Um, so it made sense both of us have um, uh, an interest in photography um, to do a capstone um, project for school together sort of around that we actually had both had um, different ideas going into like the semester before we started our capstone and we're just sitting in a park one day neither of us were super excited about the things we had planned to do and we're like let's just make some cameras so um, that's how how we ended up there and yeah, like Ben said, um, industrial design is, is sort of an interesting lens to do this through, Oof, pun not intended, but um, uh, just we are so heavily involved in um, the production of products, but it's usually not so much on a homemade scale. So, but both of us have, have experience making things, anything from Ben has made crazy guitars and uh, I've designed and built furniture to, you know, uh, building random stuff in the backyard when I was a kid. So um, I think we both come from sort of a making background and then bring in the, this perspective of like more mass production. Um, and so it was interesting to like figure out where we wanted this project to land. And, and so one of the things uh, that I said to you maybe six months ago was um, <clears throat> you both need to find jobs, your, your children. Um, <laughs> Isn't it a little crazy that, uh, you know, your thesis or capstone project for um, kind of like what, what you might go showboating around 
is an industrial design for a film camera that will clearly never get produced. Um, mm -hmm. And and you guys kind of said to me like we are rock stars and we have jobs already and we are <laughs> interested in this. Um, but also, you know, at least in your renders, you showed me a lot of cameras that um, would not have been buildable industrially uh, through much of the history of when people were industrially building cameras. And so I, I thought it was a very you know, interesting take on, on you know, what you might do or representation of, uh, you know, some design skill rather than an actual product that, that you know, obviously your weirdo cameras will never hit market uh, right. with a with million dollars worth of tooling when the market is, you know, a thousand people, but, um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So that's actually been um, definitely a challenge of this of this project. Um, kind of communicating these ideas to um, the industrial design world that really operates at scale. Mm -hmm. um, and we have definitely gotten pushback on this project from a pure industrial design standpoint. But we knew that going in, and we we sort of resolved to do a project that we were passionate about and interested in, and bring industrial design skills and thinking to a less traditionally industrial design project yeah. and you know there we've, we've had we've presented this to, to some people that just especially in, in like industrial design people that just do not get it do not like it mm -hmm. they're like who's the user why is this not manufacturable at a, at a large scale who are you trying to sell this to mm -hmm. um but but that ended up kind of being sort of the fun of the project too do you think in a way it takes some of the pressure off that um, it's like purely a hypothetical project, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah, for us, uh, a, large, a large part of the project itself was in the critique that we offered up, which I'm sure we're gonna get into. Um, so that, that for us served as like the main, like one of the main points of interest for the project. And then the other was uh, we did wanna show showcase like, um, actually like building stuff and making stuff ourselves. Um, like at school, I used to run our CNC machines, run and program them. So I was like excited to like put that skill to use to like uh, cut some aluminum. And um, as David said, he's like spent a lot of time in the wood shop building, uh, building furniture and things like that. And so we were really hoping to uh, kind of offer up a critique, show that we can make real things because of, a larger issue or not an issue, but something that we see in the world of industrial design is just like a lot of renders of things that um, that aren't like manufacturable or can't be made. Uh, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, uh, we did hit a point where like we had to deliver something for our uh, actual curriculum. And so that involved um, switching to making it more of a rendering project. So. So yeah. we'll, we'll get into, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the specific project soon. Um, I think it's, you know, certainly we on this podcast are uh, guilty of doing the how way more than the why. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think you guys did a, a very nice job and, and wrote, I don't know, 7 million pages on the why. Um, <laughs> and I, I think that was, was pretty neat. But um, before we get to that a um, little bit about your histories. Um, it sounds like you guys have been taking pictures for quite some time now. Um, have you built other cameras before this project, either of you? Uh, when I was much younger, I would take apart disposable cameras all the time and like turn them into pinholes or like make them reusable. Um, and then like played around with that sort of area of things like making pinholes for digital cameras and things like that. Um, but nothing, nothing to this extent, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is really, I, I think, the first experience truly building cameras for me. Um, both of us started off in, in digital photography, you know, five, six, seven years ago. And recently, in the past two years, three years, maybe, um, got more heavily into film and, like, both pretty much exclusively shoot film now. Um, so it was definitely, you know, a... Uh, uh, a daunting um, idea to, to try and build cameras that, you know, were kind of beyond the scope of anything that we had done before. But both of us had a pretty good, like, technical understanding of photography and, and camera parts. Um, and so we were excited to uh, to dive into the to the making side. 
And how about uh, building other things, right? So, I mean, uh, ID is really maligned by a lot of uh, engineers. There's always like beef on Reddit, right? Uh, <laughs> the, the two things clearly go in hand in hand. Um, mm -hmm. Have there been other things that you guys have built uh, that you're particularly proud of that, that became an object, even if not, you know, industrially manufactured, but, um, you know, a prototype that you might have and use or something like that? Yeah, so I guess like a little bit more background is that at the University of Cincinnati, we've had like, what, five internships across the five years we've been in school. And it's been like a year round after the first year. So um, I think both of us have like real things on the market that like people are buying, uh, which really? I think we're can, pretty can you proud about. What they are? Uh, so I have, a, I have a watch uh, that I designed at Fossil. Um, I'm not sure if it's still being sold, but uh, for a few seasons, they sold it under the name Fossil Barstow, B-A-R-S-T-O-W. It's like yeah. a like minimalist watch. I don't know. And then a lot of things haven't hit the market either. And that's like probably one of the issues that I, I can't talk about some of the other things. I don't know about you, David. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have a ton of stuff that I've worked on that hasn't come out maybe will never come out it's really hard to know like once you're once you hand that project off um i do i think the one of the only things that i've worked on that has hit the market is a projector for your anime girlfriend um, <laughs> <laughs> so you know that's a great piece to put in my portfolio it's essentially it's like a coffee maker looking thing like literally with like a glass barrel on the front about coffee maker size and instead of coffee in the glass barrel it's a has like a, a flat um, pane of glass that there's a, a project uh, projected image of like an anime girl that like talks I've to you. And... We've seen this product yeah. on the internet for sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. And David, what's what's it called? Where can people find that product? So that one is called um, Tencent Project S, um, and there are only a few like renderings of it on the internet i don't know if you ever even were able to buy it um it's it's like definitely for the the asian market um more so than the us but to get a good sense of what it is like um there's another one that existed before the one that i worked on that's called the gatebox and if you just look up gatebox um and watch the like commercial for it there's like a two minute commercial it is um incredibly hilariously sad uh, so I recommend uh, it's a good viewing experience for sure. Yeah. Cool. It sounds like a great product for photographers. Yeah. <laughs> the ideal photo um, shoot uh, for COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, so uh, I think we were just kind of looking at the macro trend of people switching back to film and, and seeing that in ourselves, obviously, you know, we were super interested in film photography, even though digital photography is really accessible um, and seeing so many people shooting film when they could be shooting digital and just wanted to dive, I guess, yeah, the impetus for this project was wanting to dive a little bit deeper into the, the why behind that. Why are people so drawn to film? And and because I always like to get to the brass tacks of things, and and you guys are a little bit more philosophy. Um, what was the like? What was the? I don't want to say assignment, but but there there were some strictures put on you, right? Uh, this this is for a school project. It wasn't just something that you wanted to do. Um, what was that brief like? Right. So this was, yeah, you're right, a school project and there were some um, parameters set on it, but I would say in kind of in the course of, of our education, this was the most free form project that we've had. So it was very much like there, there had to be some sort of designed output, um, which I mean, you'll, you'll see once we get to the end of this. Um, but that was that was really it. Um, and uh, I mean, really, the only other parameter is that because we were working as a group, there is an expectation that we would do like a two person amount of work over mm -hmm. the course of four months. So I think you guys other did than that, that person amount of work for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, yeah. before we get into it, have you guys seen um, Lars von Trier's The Five Obstructions? I don't uh, think so. I can't say I'm I have. Constantly talking about it on the podcast. He. Uh, Lars von Trier goes and finds like one of his favorite filmmakers from like the sixties or seventies. And he challenges him to remake, uh, his, one of his previous films. It was a short film, uh, mm -hmm. five different ways. And each way Lars von Trier gives him some obstruction. Like, uh, mm -hmm. one, my favorite was he had to make it with only 12 frame clips at 24 P. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I, I feel like that was a very design school type of, thing and, and really sort of inspiring to me as a designer, if you can call me that, I play one on YouTube. Um, but <laughs> the last and the hardest one, the obstruction was there are no obstructions, do whatever you want. And uh, right. that, that turned out to be you know much more difficult, although he, he came out with an amazing film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I will say, and we don't really talk about this a ton in the presentation of this because the presentation is intended to be a sort of polished um, uh, summary of this process, but we did, I think it, just just like you're saying, that was the hardest part of mm -hmm. the beginning of this project is like, okay, we want to do something in film. We can do really anything we want as long as we design camera or design something. What mm -hmm. are we going to do? Um, and it was really hard to sort of wrap our minds around some like something specific. You know, what what was it that we had to say? Mm -hmm. um, and so the way we've like framed this project has changed so many times in the past couple months. And you know, we think it's one thing and we get really uh, into something. And then we have sort of a moment where we're like, oh, wait, maybe we're thinking about this in, in sort of a different way. And then we go back and reframe. So yeah. it was super challenging um, because of that, I think. It also seems like the classic pro progression in any school, right, is like you have a, uh, you have to make a very small part of a thing and you have a lot of obstructions or, or limitations mm -hmm. in that thing. And then, you know, the limitations start coming off and things get more complex until like the hardest thing. And, and, and maybe, I, maybe I'm wrong, but this seems like it would have been the largest sort of project that you guys have done yeah. in school. Um, it seems fairly free flowing. The hard thing is like with it being like, with it like having the potential to be anything, it's like really finding the constraints for yourself that, um, proved to be like David was talking about, like some of the more difficult things. But um, I think that like using the point of like, all right, there's something here with film photography that people are putting down digital cameras for served as like the basis of like what we want to investigate. Um, and from there, we kind of like the whole project started to like manifest itself. Yeah, so then jumping right back into the presentation from that. Yeah, uh, yeah. so as we were talking about, film photography seems to be like picking up right um but there's like upon further like investigation of like the actual process at hand there seems to be like more to it than like just the aesthetic of shooting film i'm sure that's what a lot of people get into it for uh but there's something about the user experience that uh adds like a lot of value 
Yeah, so we kind of uh, distilled those aspects down to sort of the tangible nature of film, um, that it's, it's a, a finite resource. Um, and it's something that you can, you know, physically feel, hold, interact with. Um, there's this aspect of decoupling that, that arises when you shoot film where you have, uh, you can't review an image right away, right? So you have to be a little bit more intentional about the results that you're trying to get. Um, and then there's also the variability. There's um, certainly a process to learning how to shoot film and understanding how film reacts, how, you know, different developers are going to change your film, mm -hmm. you know, different processes. Um, and so there's like a, a, an element of learning there that you don't necessarily get with a digital camera yeah. as much. And something that like um, we kind of came upon is it seems to be and maybe you because uh, you've seen the transition, Ethan, um, it seems to be people don't really shoot film the way like in the time of in the, like the age of film people were shooting. Uh, it seems to be like uh, it serves like a little bit different of a niche and people are shooting for obviously different reasons. Um, I'm curious if that's something that like you'd agree yeah, with. This is one of the very few podcasts where I get to uh, be the dinosaur in the room. Um, you know, I, I used to work in a, a photo studio where, you know, we shot four by fives, not like, you know, for unpredictability in art, but mm -hmm. if we wanted to, you know, ship a Chrome to somebody across the world so they could inspect the flaws in a diamond. Um, yeah. And so we used it for you know, technical precision, but it, you know, at, my entire life, probably like you guys, um, I used photography or film photography in, in almost the same way. Um, you guys actually remind me of one of my best friends and my college roommate, Han Wang, who I get to be his, uh, his reverend at his wedding in Ibiza last year. Um, but, you know, at, at some point in college, which would have been kind of early digital years, um, I gave Han like a $50 Minolta that I had sitting around mm -hmm. and like within a week he had bought himself a Leica and just <laughs> was really captured by it. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I, I think we certainly used film for things like um, sports uh, and mm -hmm. photojournalism and um, just recording technical uh, details. So, you know, I, I have a a uh, friend of the family who worked for Con Edison is the power company in New York. And he managed and shot archives of millions of photos that, you know, had, I mean, I think they're beautiful and I don't want to say they have no artistic value. They just had no mm -hmm. artistic purpose. They were so yeah. you could document where the power lines were under the street. So the next time you break up the street, you know where to break up instead of ripping up Fifth Avenue, you know, end to end. And, you know, I had, uh, my friend Eric, uh, was like, um, the film runner ball boy for photographers at the US Open in Queens when we were kids, you know, and he ran film from photographers to the lab. Like mm -hmm. there were a lot of practical uses of photography that were not yeah. necessarily just aesthetic uh, that mm -hmm. have com completely been replaced, right? Like yeah. I need a product shot on the internet. I do not shoot a Chrome, scan it, you know, take it to the mm -hmm. lab, pick it up, scan it, put it on the internet. Uh, and tell people about a product. I just, I, I have this Sony that I'm talking to you on, you know? Yeah. But right. um, I think in some ways I always carried a film camera to document my life. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people have and just either never made the switch or made the switch and came back. And like, you know, film is expensive these days, but it's it's not gold. Um, mm -hmm. It's still available. I don't know that it will always be available. I hope it is. I mean, I sell mm -hmm. film products, but um, yeah, I think. I wouldn't say it's used in a different way. I would say it's used in the same way that it always was in one of those ways. And then okay. the vast yeah. majority of the other ways, you know, have just switched and for good reason. Mm -hmm. Oh, and um, so we're, we're going through these slides and you're describing them. They might be a little hard to see on the screen. I just want to note that um, I'm going to put a link to this paper you guys put okay. out, which is excellent okay, uh, cool. show notes below. Um, but oh yeah, if you're zoomed in, that's, that's yeah. Awesome. There you go. Let's let's keep going. Gotcha. Um, so that kind of brings us to the like what we've been hitting at this whole time. Um, for some reason, people are putting down their iPhone to switch to. I mean, this is an extreme example, like a crown graphic, but um, switch to like more difficult to use processes. And uh, there was like an itch that maybe like there's something, there's some reason, there's something that people are getting more out of, uh, and we want to investigate that further. 
Yeah. So our question is in an age where you can shoot and post a photo and like a single click of a button, it's easier than it ever has been to take uh, and share a photograph. Why are people still using more complicated means of, of photo creation? Um, and so we, we kind of saw um, that trend elsewhere in life. And so there are, um, uh, you know, sort of for all human history, we've been creating tools to make things easier. Um, but we took a step back and, and looked at um, times when simplicity maybe isn't necessarily like the best way to go about something. Um, and so we ended up referencing a couple different studies um, that showed uh, a lot of times that if, if you have sort of a more complicated process, that there's added value in, uh, in doing something that way. So obviously also there's, there's always value for doing things an easy way, but sometimes you get more learning out of a hard way. So like one example of, of, of these studies was um, they had a bunch of kids read for comprehension using different typefaces and some of the more complicated typefaces to read like papyrus or comic sans or something like that. Um, they found that the children were actually like retaining more of the information. So that's just one example of, of a way that we saw maybe complexity adding value um, to, to process and in, in other aspects of life. I don't want to take you on too much of a tangent, but this is kind yeah. of something that I think about often. Um, I think about people as uh, often having like laser beam or flashlight type intelligence. Um, and some people might say that's like, uh, you know, normal people versus Asperger's -y people or, or some spectrum in between. But like, um, I think I do very well focusing on one thing in depth. Mm -hmm. and, and it gives me like sort of a superpower, but it's also my Achilles heel because I might disappear into my shop for three weeks, not take a bath, you know, <laughs> let my life fall apart, have to like, you know, figure out if I've paid my rent and my internet bill mm -hmm. over the last three weeks where I disappeared, right? It's like extreme focus. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some real benefit to that. And then there's some people who are like very intelligent, uh, but sort of look at everything at once and maybe don't get sucked into something that necessarily takes you know, thousands of hours to uh, get into. I wonder if that has something to do with making things more difficult by uh, obfuscating or, or complicating the process, like making people read things in wingdings, mm -hmm. or if you guys came to a different conclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like kind of causing people to, t to pay more attention when they maybe mm -hmm. wouldn't necessarily otherwise. Uh, yeah, I think that um, that's definitely true that you have people that even in a simple process are going to dedicate a lot of time and attention to, to that thing. And maybe you have other people that aren't necessarily, and sometimes adding a, a level of targeted complexity is, is like a way mm -hmm. of, of equalizing that attention span. I think that that's, that's yeah. an interesting theory. Uh, it seems to be that like, there's like some element of like friction that like slows you down and makes you forces you to like pay a little bit more attention and, um, I guess that's like kind of what we ran with in this project as like uh, what we want to use to go forward. Um, so yeah, this whole idea of adding intentional complexity and friction to like increase your focus or to draw attention to certain areas of the user experience. Um, but I mean, you kind of run into this issue where that runs anathema to what we do as like designers. So within our field, it's always about like, what can we do to streamline the process? What can we do to make sure like the users having like the the easiest time doing exactly what they want? And you know what you get with cameras is like an iPhone. Um, but uh, the whole the whole idea here is like, well, maybe there's also a, like an area for a product to like slow you down a little bit. Yeah. So I, I think we're taught in design specifically to it's, it's always about making the easiest experience possible and we don't disagree with that necessarily i think what we found through this um process was that there's maybe space for both there's always you know we're never going to design something that's going to be more popular than an iphone for photography um we're never going to design something that's going to be better than digital cameras that are on the market. But what we can do is is look at things through a slightly different lens and offer something that um, that takes photos differently than you can with either of those and adds value in sort of a different um, a different way. So I mean, you you guys are talking about uh, products like the iPhone as if um, the simplest or easy to use is always the best. But you know, there's plenty of things that I think about where it's um, really about a pleasurable user experience uh, to mm -hmm. me like the immediate thing that 
comes to mind is like a manual transmission car, right? Mm -hmm. They're still being sold. We have computers that have, you know, basically control of a manual transmission and, uh, you know, all of, all of the benefits with none of the work, but like, um, and, and I, I'm not pushing film cameras over iPhones. Like I think iPhones are great, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, can you guys think of some other examples, um, in life or, or design that you know of that are, you know, intentionally more difficult to use or more complicated to use, I should say, uh, that enhance the user experience? Uh, I mean, a really good example is from the world of, uh, like, uh, user experience, like, uh, like phone app design, mobile design. I guess that's the, the phrase. Um, think about your like banking app. Many of them, if you make a transaction, will flip the confirmation button to, if, if you can imagine in your head, a lot of the times like you'll have a confirmation button on the right and then like uh, something to cancel on the left. They give you those two options. Many times they'll switch it. So you've trained yourself to like click okay by clicking on the rightmost button, right? But in this case, it's backwards and it slows you down. And for good reason, like, are you sure you want to do this? Um, so like that, that's a really cut and dry example. Um, and as far as you were going to say uh, analog watches. Yep. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they're, they're awesome, right? Like they're, they're not going to keep, keep nah, man, time. Well, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I don't know, like, do you have anything to add, David, as far as I mean, everyone's picking yeah, I mean, up I... like, Go ahead. I think it definitely plays into the the sort of analog revolution, as, mm -hmm. as people say, where people are returning to film, people are listening to vinyl records again, things like that, where it's just like it, it adds a little bit of, of inconvenience, I guess, to the process of, of doing something that you could do really easily with modern technology. But then it adds um, sort of a depth of experience that we're obviously not getting elsewhere because that's why people mm -hmm. are, are returning to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I guess like we can briefly touch on this slide, but um, basically the whole idea is like this project, uh, as we've been talking about this whole time, isn't necessarily about like creating a like good product market fit uh, for like make manufacturing like hundreds of thousands of these cameras, but it's more about exploring this idea that we've been uh, talking about the whole time. So um, just to like collect ourselves again uh the whole idea or for this project we like kind of created the goal of uh building cameras and processes that magnify the value uh that seems to be lost in digital photography um by like magnifying uh some of these aspects to create more to put more uh emphasis on like the experience over like maybe the image outcome or something like that And so uh, kind of the, the three elements of photography that we distilled down to as being um, uh, valuable and, and maybe value that's lost in digital photography are these, these um, ideas of connection, intention, and exploration. So the, the connection being like the emotional and physical attachment to the subject or um, the space or the process, the intention being sort of the, the foresight and the vision that goes into the making of an image and the exploration being this like uh, learning process um, that comes with uh, mastering um, a series of, of inputs to get its desired outputs. And then so these three themes um, that, that we distilled like value down to will kind of show up throughout the project. Um, oh, interesting. Uh, so um, from that, we kind of narrowed down into um, like, images that we thought like image processes that we thought spoke to each of those um, values. Um, in the coming slides, we'll like talk about kind of how we got there, but just to start. Um, and lucky for us, this is a camera podcast, so people usually know what we're talking about. Um, but this is here for uh, educating some of the industrial designers we try to uh, pitch this to. So you got um, burst camera or burst photography. So like taking multiple frames uh, or taking multiple images onto a single frame, long exposure, uh, taking like very long like exposure over time, then pinholes and then slit scan. So this is a little bit more obscure, but literally just like in our case, dragging like film across the slit, a thin slit in the focal plane 
uh, sampling like a thin strip of the image over time. Uh, and each of those respectively, uh, we intended to get at the connection for the burst uh, intention with the long exposure and exploration. And we can talk a little bit more in depth about like these choices we made in the process slides. Now we're getting so, into the yeah. part. Yeah, now we're getting into it. So um, this is, yeah, like Ben mentioned, this is actually going backwards a little bit. So this slide is kind of from our process before we landed on those um, those ideas and then those um, sort of uh, image processes that were intended to reflect those, those values. Um, and so really the way that we started this project was, all right, we know that we wanna do cameras. Um, what what can we what can we do differently? What what can we play with? So we really got into just sort of um, sticky noting, spitballing ideas on how can we augment inputs to achieve different outputs, and then what you know what potentially is the value added or lost in that process. So, um, so. two things is one um, whoever is controlling the screen share, can you zoom in so we can take a look at that? And two is sticky noting a uh, industry standard term. I think uh, I just made that one up, but it's a, it's an industry standard process for sure. Yeah, yeah. Sticky notes. 3M makes loads of money off of industrial designers. Uh, it's a it's definitely a staple in the process. Um, um, yeah, I don't know how here, but yeah, I don't know how high res this image is, but um, so Ben, do you want to like? I think we yeah we can see your cursor on the screen. So if you want to just like talk through. Um, yeah, so like David was saying, um, we kind of started just thinking about like what we can do, like what can you do to like the focal plane, what can you do to like the shutter, like what are different like experimental like photographic processes that we could like roll into this. Um, and we considered like, I don't know, like stuff all across the board, like exposing two sides of, uh, of like 35 millimeter film or like uh you know your standard like pinhole but like what can we do like that's different and that will come to play later as you'll see and then um like uh just trying to get inspired by what people have done with uh with film and leaning on that uh specifically so um i mean this is kind of like bits and pieces from the process but like you can see up here we're trying to like figure out like what these different processes might um might like give you differently so we could start to sort it into those um the values that we talked about earlier um to be honest i don't it's it looks like it's down sampled a little bit on my side so i can't exactly read off these um but like here There's like a uh, yell enhance it. sorry just you you have a yell enhance at your computer yeah yeah <laughs> for those of you following along at home uh you know Go go download the PDF. It's great. You can zoom in there. Um, yeah, and then so just like some some examples of what things we're looking at in these images, like in the this bottom left corner down here, this is uh, Ben's crazy idea of somehow having like um, things that hold the the film that you can push back and forth on sliders, so you get like weird warps in the focal plane of the film, um, mm -hmm. and like seeing what that would do. Uh, we talked about, yeah, like Ben said, like sort of having lenses on on either side of a camera and then shooting onto um, like 35 millimeter film from both sides and exposing like onto the onto the uh, emulsion side, but then also through the through the film um, from the other side, just like things like that. Mm -hmm. And then this the, these top like little like triangular graphs up here are. So, you know, we, we come up with all these ideas of what can we change? What is that going to do differently? And then we're sort of trying to map them on terms of like, in terms of what, how did those reflect um, the values that we want to see in this project? And do they, do they add value? Mm -hmm. um, and so this is very, very early in the process. This is from, you know, probably six or seven months ago now. Um, maybe even before we spoke to you, actually. Um, yeah, we've had some of these. Yeah. So it's just sort of trying to, to wrap our heads around um, how do we categorize these things that we change and like why are we changing them? What does it add? There's a lot of shapes and uh, ideas there, not necessarily around you know um, reducing image quality, if you will, but but mm -hmm. around you know camera shapes that I recognize there and kind of see what you're up to. I see some mm -hmm. plots. I see some 3D printed <laughs> cameras. I see some film gates. Uh, you're mm -hmm. both really good at drawing, which I wish I was as well. We, 
we get paid to do it, so we have. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, unrelated question. Maybe you can answer this for mm -hmm. me. What's with the color wash squares behind uh, product design sketches? Like, uh, we call those vignettes. They're just there for eye candy. Uh, I mean, functionally, it groups ideas. Um, it looks really nice. Uh, is kind of the the reason behind it. But yeah, I mean, if I if I throw like a little colored vignette behind things, usually I'm like grouping ideas. Gotcha. Yeah, and a lot of times too on, I mean, you can see some of these sketches are, we have a little bit nicer sketches, I think, somewhere in this presentation, but you can see a lot of these ideas are pretty dirty. So sometimes just throwing a, a, a vignette behind something calls attention to like something specifically that you want people to get out of the page. And it's also just like a industrial design style thing that's sort of shoved down our throat in school. So. Right, I had no industrial design training whatsoever, right? But I exist in, in that world or adjacent to it. And I see... I see that everywhere. I've even tried it <laughs> without knowing why. Yeah. Uh, and wondered. Yeah, thank you for answering that for me. It's kind of I mean, a similar thing is like we all write in all capital letters. And I don't think anybody ever told us to do that or like taught us to do it, but it's something that you see all industrial designers do. So eventually mm -hmm. we all just kind of adopt it. We're like, I guess this is what we're supposed Engineers to do. Engineers and architects also do that. Yeah. I do it, yeah. you know, when labeling uh, things. I've done a lot of engineering projects with people who's uh, first language is not necessarily English and, you know, it's like visual communication, but necessarily I got to right. write a couple of things and I try, you know, architect handwriting is slightly different from engineer handwriting or, mm -hmm. or, or the ideal from it for it. Um, but I, I try and mimic as, as close as I can for clarity, yeah. but for beauty. Uh, so here's like some of the sketching more in depth. These are like a little bit more polished. Um, and at this point, we were kind of honing in on um, specific like image processes we wanted to see. So like, uh, for instance, like the slit scan started to pop out as like something that seemed really like fun, something that you could do with like film very easily. That's like not as readily available with digital unless like you're willing to jump into some uh, computer coding. Um, Things like uh, mul the mul the multi exposure, and then things about like trying to change like the focal plane to see like if we could get anything funky out of like a tilt shift effect effect or like uh, increasing the FOV or something like that. Yeah, some some call-outs here. You see some, like, big... some of the best camera cartoons I have ever seen. <laughs> um, you see at at the top some like larger, more like circular things with like circular arrows going around them. That's where we're looking at putting like a film strip, loading a film strip all the way around in a circle and then like sliding a, rem a lens around in a circle and exposing that way. Um, just like some some funky stuff like that. So that's mm -hmm. like, it, that's in the slip scan family. Um, and then uh, and then obviously you see some, some things um, a little bit closer to what we actually arrived at too, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Um... I guess like the next step in our process was like we had to kind of find an idea of like the uh, the photographic processes we wanted to look at, uh, th those being the burst, multi exposure and uh, like extreme long exposure. So we started like hacking together uh, cameras in order to create these images. And so um, many of the photos you'll see uh, that we present in this whole entire thing will happen at this stage because unfortunately everything kind of fell apart because uh, COVID hit right in the middle of our uh, semester and then we no longer had access to the tools we needed to further develop. Um, but I guess this point would be a little bit more fun to just show, uh, like I think we have most of these in person. So instead of- oh, uh, I can't wait. Uh, That's great. That is my uh, nefarious reason for having you on the podcast is like, <laughs> I, I read and loved and shared the mm -hmm. document, but I was really hoping that you would show me some uh, prototypes. Yeah, yeah. So, and, uh, ben and I also talked about this uh, beforehand too. I think we're, we're, we're happy to share CAD for stuff as well. If, uh, oh, yeah. if you want to yeah. download this and, and play around, print, print stuff, um, but yeah. A lot of this process for us as industrial designers is we're, we're, we're used to working back and forth like very much between 2D, like the sketching that you saw, but then also 
um, 3D as well. So we bought a 3D printer. Um, we're putting it to, to crazy use. Actually, for a while, it was sitting on my bedside table, like right next to my head as I was sleeping, which is probably like toxic and not a good idea. But uh, yeah. Um, so uh, I think sort of the first uh, camera that we started iterating with was um, the pinhole long exposure. Um, and so this is uh, one of the this one, I think we took the most um, 3D development on just to get parts and pieces coming together properly. But um, so what you have here is um, like two two parts here that slide together. This bottom piece is um, where you load the film, it takes 120 film. And then there's this curved focal plane here that the film slots through. Um, Hold that a little closer to the screen. So Yeah, there you go. So film, uh, in here, take up spool in here, or the other way around, it doesn't actually really mm -hmm. matter. And then um, you kind of uh, load the film through this um, curve. And one one thing that we really had to work a lot on is sort of the radius from um, the uh, where the, the, the spool lives into this um, curved yeah. focal plane to get it to be able to like pull smoothly through. And we still have some issues with that that uh, we need to, to work through a little bit, but uh, it ended up being um, all right. And then so what's cool about this is this um, focal plane is curved concentric to the pinhole in the front. So the pinhole is just we have a piece of foil in here with a, a, a it's like a 0.2 millimeter um, pinhole. And um, so what that what that allows for is um, super, super wide images, it's like well, 150 yeah. degree field of view um, that has almost no distortion um, just be because it's uh, curved concentric to the focal plane. Um, yeah. So, that so it's like a, it's a 120 uh, frame or sorry, it, it takes 120 film and then it takes two six by six frames. So uh, essentially like a 120 in the like circumference, right? And then it wraps around and the uh, pinholes at 65 millimeters. Uh, I can hear, this might be better if we tumble it. Um, let me pull that up real fast. Yeah, and so while he's pulling that up, just sort of the way this works is we have um, little spool mounts for, I don't know if you can still see me. Um, ben can show you in CAD. Yeah, so um, again, this was just to like prototype, like to see if we, uh, well, if this would do anything. So, um, the, the inspiration came from like doing the like those uh, pinhole uh, coffee can like photographs. Uh, and so I like was looking at those and I thought that that was like super interesting, like what having a curved focal plane with like uh, kind of like the infinite focus of a pinhole, like what what that got you. Um, so we want to prove if like you could get an image out of this system and we'll, we'll show this later, I suppose, um, with the actual cameras. But uh, let's see if I can get you like a little cross-section analysis. Yeah, so the what he was just talking about is like we had that like multiple different elements and it just kind of slots in there. Um, and then these uh, these film winders just kind of pop up there. There's some like baffling. Um, Again, this was primarily held together by tape, uh, so it would need a lot of work to like just work out of the box as a 3D printed camera. Um, we got yeah, this some... was about about uh, like 40 minutes of taping probably to get this thing all light tight in a way yeah. that we were comfortable with. Yeah, I think a lot of the beef between uh, industrial designers and engineers has to do with like fit tolerances and manufacturing <laughs> tolerances. Um, but I love that you guys have built it and you know found those problems yeah, um, you, yeah they're not really like problems like it would stop you it's just that's that's something you've got to do uh, there's a guy on the internet who has been designing panoramic 3d printed cameras and does not own a 3d printer mm -hmm. and has been releasing the files and i feel bad for anybody trying to mm -hmm. print that because as clever as it is like you know i can design a camera in two weeks and it will take me two and a half, three months to get it to actually fit right. after it's mm -hmm. uh, printed in the real world. Yeah, usually I add a little um, like parameter that I can pull into dimensions just called slop for 3D printing. Uh -huh. uh, and I usually like just apply that as like uh, kind of over the like over everything. But 
in this case, it looks like I didn't put it in there, but you can kind of get an idea of like, what? I generally work with five or six different uh, tolerance parameters mm -hmm. in my CAD models for different types of fits and joints. Yeah. Press fits, screw fits, uh, sliding fits, uh, press, mm -hmm. you know, uh, loose press fits or screw fits. Yeah, and then the other um, just sort of information piece on this is uh, we just used a piece of tape over the front um, as, as a shutter, and then there's actually a little slot in the back um, where you can see the the film counter, and then we just had um, you know another yeah. piece of tape over that, and then mm -hmm. you just wind the two top knobs in tandem, um, and, and that advances your film, and you can see in this in that hole on the back when you're uh, at the next frame, and so it's every, just every two frames, so starting at yeah. one three, or actually I guess starting at two four, and then um, we use a foil pinhole for this, uh, not too scientific, and just kind of like sandwiched it on there. Uh, with that part uh to get the point about tolerances like that needs to be tightened up because it has a habit of falling off which we solved with tape but it's not ideal um here i'll kill this and we can move on to the next one um you want to do slit scan so do you want to do you want to show some photos from that first just to uh, round that out sure let's see if yeah, we can uh we'll have to skip ahead here yeah that's fine yeah, so, um, oh, here, uh, you can see, like, the, am I screen sharing anymore? No. Nope. No. Nope. Okay. Sorry about that. Well, he pulls that up just to explain sort of the, the, the thought there, or, or um, the process that, that ended up being was um, we took long exposure photos, um, depending, so this is depending on the light condition for now, since we didn't have sort of any way to extend exposure times um, Beyond just what the what the uh, the uh, exposure needed, um, so this is everywhere from like two minute exposure indoors to ten to twenty seconds outdoors, um, depending on where we were shooting. And for the actual final design of this camera, we just included a, a, a ND filter mount in the front, so you could just add ND yeah. filters to um, a little screw mount that time. Yeah. Um. So further on, I'll have to skip through a whole bunch of this if we want to get to the other images, but you get an idea of here. here. This is uh, inside of our school DAP. Um, it has like this wild field of view. And something that like was interesting about the long exposure is we were hoping that like you'd get like artifacts of like human life, right? Like people walking by, we were hoping for like a nice motion blur. But the thing is over like yeah, these extreme, it. yeah these extreme long exposures, you get none of it. And it's like ghostly. Uh, later on, we'll show you a photo of like a street and there's just no cars on it. And it's there were, but like when we were taking it, there were like 30 cars that passed. So you want to like, zoom in on, on that photo of, of the two of us on, in that one? Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, while we were taking this, if you can see the little ghosts here, uh, we hopped over there for half of the image. Uh, so that's me and David uh, sitting for the first shot we took. That's great. And we were actually super fortunate in the um, in the development of all these cameras that they all worked kind of how we intended them to the first try, which was crazy. Um, and we were doing all the all of the development ourselves, like in our kitchen, um, which our roommates loved chemicals everywhere. Um, and just like, you know, we'd pull, we'd pull out a roll after the first time trying a new camera and it would like mm -hmm. all look right. And we're like, oh my God, it worked. <laughs> so that's pretty fun. Yeah. And I guess while we're on the topic of this, um, I can pull up like just an idea for the size of the negative. Let's get some of this. All right. There's something that's interesting about mm -hmm. this um, is that you know, I'm very familiar with fil curved film planes, right? I've made mm -hmm. one of oatmeal box cameras, but the fact yeah. that you made a curved film plane curved about, you know, uh, the pinhole being mm -hmm. the vertex of the circle, um, instead of getting a crazy distortion, you're actually getting no distortion. Yeah, right? yeah. You actually so that's what we were shocked curve. by. Mm -hmm. it's, it's crazy. Um, it's amazing I guess what like that works out in the real world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we could have we could have thought harder about it and probably guessed what it would look like. But yeah, it was cool to just like try it and see. That's that's the magic of these 3D printers, though. It's like you can just do that. Um, it's like an awesome tool that like for many years no one really had access to. Um, for the next one, we'll do the slit scan. 
So to prototype this, um, earlier that semester, I was like playing around with, uh, is my screen sharing? It shouldn't be, it should just be no. me. All right. So we were, I was playing around with um, putting 35 millimeter in 120. So I got my trusty dinosaur RB67. Oh yeah. Um, and uh, so I had these inserts laying around for 35 millimeter. Uh, we figured we could use the wind because 120 is like a six by seven image is like huge compared to 35 millimeters. So we use the winding action as the uh, advance for the slit scan. Um, and we also we've got, yeah. quick, Go quick note here. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, some of you might be familiar with um, slit scan cameras that uh, where the the slit rotates across the um, like the front of the lens. So we actually, we took a slightly different approach on this where the slit is stationary, but it's actually the film that moves. Um, so what yeah. Ben is talking about is we're trying to figure out a quick way to prototype like that film movement across a continuously mm -hmm. exposed slit. Yeah, so we just made this uh, little insert. I think it came out to be like about a mil. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time we did like, maybe it's half a mil, um, but we did um, some like back of the envelope calculations about like, what we think the exposure would be as you like go across because uh, that's pretty easy. We know the size of the image. We know how much or the size of the opening. We know how large of uh, film advance was going to happen. Uh, and so you could kind of ballpark like, oh, this is going to be like a 60th of a second, roughly, if you like pull this, if you like advance for like a second or something. And so were you yeah. just counting like one Mississippi and trying to do yeah. it? Smartly? Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I think oh, yeah. the homemade camera builders will really dig that approach. Yeah, and that was, and that was, that was awesome. Actually, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just that, that was how we determined the size of that slit then. We're like, okay, mm -hmm. you know, we know the film is going to advance this much in this amount of time, so this is the speed of it. And then mm -hmm. to kind of adjust for exposure um, at yeah, in sunlight, like this is how big the slit needs to be then. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of work, work the math backwards there. And then obviously yeah, and then, you still have on, on the RB67, you still have your aperture adjustments, so so you can mm -hmm. sort of amend that a little bit depending on the lighting situation. Yeah, and then revision number two for that was taking um, M42 mount lens, standing it off at the right distance, and then um, I found this nice little box on GrabCAD. So we're gonna probably have to give attribution to the dude who um, like built the like film advance. Uh, but for our purposes, we we're just prototyping here. Um, so basically just quickly model uh, little handle. Yeah, yeah, and then we got the the little pressure plate here, uh, old box of uh, probably T-Max. Uh, yeah, and so this was super straightforward. It turned out to give you like really choppy images, but like, again, we were just seeing if it worked. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really neat little camera. It is certainly nicer to carry around than a RB67. It looks really yeah. clean to me. I think mm -hmm. that's one of the designs that you guys have made that is mm -hmm. different than anything that I have seen 3D printed. And it's different than most. I mean, I've seen plenty of slit scan cameras, right? But mm -hmm. it reminds me of the Lomo Kino version of a slit scan camera. Um, I think it's really great. And I also think, um, you know, maybe it's not a multi million dollar market, but I bet there's mm -hmm. 20 or 30 people right now who want to print that thing and uh, make their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, yeah, we're definitely gonna gonna provide CAD for anyone that's interested. Um, we'll have to figure out yeah. exactly how we're gonna do that. But um, what's cool about this is, yeah, like Ben mentioned, this had a film advance, and we essentially just slapped a lever mm -hmm. on or a, a winder on top of there. And again, calculated the the length of that to be, uh, you know, about one revolution a second um, to to know your exposure. Um, yeah, and then, and then from there you can just double it if you want to change, and then you also have aperture. But you know, you just cap the lens when you're not using it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, but what that is also cool is, about? Yeah, go ahead. What is cool about this is <laughs> the two of us. Um, the theoretically, you could shoot an entire roll of film on like as yeah. one image. You could shoot a continuous. Um, and and yeah. have you been trying to shoot moving subjects with it, or move as you? Uh, like kind of this. <laughs> yeah, we did. Yeah. We did a variety of different things um, to varying results. Um, which do you want to just pull up some images? Uh, yeah. Uh, let me. You know, I'm gonna just go to my directory so we don't need to go off of this. Okay. Uh, 
but yeah, it was a little bit of both. We shot, and we also um, sort of the process for this um, in our validation for like what we needed to do for school was handing these cameras off to people to see sort of what they did with it. Um, and so we had a couple people that were um, that you know were creative and wanted to shoot all sorts of different motion, and they were moving, and the subject was moving, and just see what happens. And then some people that did very stagnant, like what if I just take like a normal portrait of someone while while winding this and we got all sorts of different results but um it's cool that like sort of through through the process of um developing this and, and playing around with it you, you start sort of start to get a better idea of what the camera is going to do as you're moving it or as your subject is moving um so you definitely learn so these are from the from the rb yeah that's great yeah so this is like I think we had it on a tripod and we were just like moving the tripod up and down as we did this one in particular. Mm -hmm. Or left um, or right, maybe. Yeah. There was definitely a period in high school where I discovered I could take self portraits on my flatbed scanner. <laughs> 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 they do, these do very much look like that. That's funny. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, so this is the first the first prototype in that RB67 mm -hmm. um, and the first roll that we shot there. So just so like you're, the you're kind of panning a little bit as you're photographing. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. So panning and then just winding that lever to, to advance the film. Let's see. So this was handheld with the crank the crank camera on 35 millimeter with the M42 mount lens. Uh, oh, here's an example. Like we tried to keep it steady, and we had like a friend do a cartwheel or something. Wow. Is that you? That's me. Yeah, that's me yeah. actually. <laughs> I, I love that, that this sort of echoes the uh, Salvador Dali flying with the cats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Paul's brief. That's great. Yeah, so that uh, was cool. And then the, the challenge here definitely was like um, getting a consistent wind because you know it tends to jerk a little bit. So. That's something that we talked about, like experimenting with a little bit more. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I was like super stoked on like the results of these images. They're like super abstract and ghostly. Yeah, but, like, you can get that, the coolest things. That so, image is um, this is, one, like what's on the cover mm -hmm. of our. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's see if I can find the while we're here. Some of the long exposure. Hey, did you think at all of making a slits cam camera where the lens swung with the film or the lens swung with the slit? Initially, yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we talked about that initially, but no, um, we didn't end up anywhere with that. Uh, we talked about like sort of a where the lens and the slit were, were paired and then you move the lens like, uh, you know, on a track sort of along the film. We thought that yeah. would be interesting. One of my favorite drawings was like the big disc where I could imagine yeah. like, on ball bearings just in the mm -hmm. lens all right. the way around. So that would be like similar to some of those like uh, panorama cameras, right? Like there's some like mm -hmm. medium format, param uh, like I remember, I think there's someone who does it locally in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. right. and wire -lock. Mm -hmm. um, there was a Kodak Panoram. There's yeah. there's a long history of those that you know are are supposed to make more um, mm -hmm. you know uh, true to life. <laughs> the, the thing that's like I mean to get a little nerdy here, you have to know the nodal point of the lens to rotate it around. Uh, if you're to do it something like the wide the wide lux. So if we were gonna propose like a camera that had like interchangeable lenses, uh, mm -hmm. that would have to be different. Um, but yeah, it would be like super cool to do like that giant disc, but we, um, one of the considerations we had was like, do we want these, like your interactions with these cameras to be very like symbolic and like, um, kind of over the top, like maybe making the long exposure camera be like, like made of cement and you have to like haul it around and place it down. Uh, but we thought just going a little bit more of like the standard product route was like an interesting pairing for this project where we have like kind of an out there idea, like a strange critique maybe, uh, but the actual products that we design uh, for the, like industrial design purposes, like for our portfolios, for instance, are like really understandable and make a lot of sense. Less art yeah. school, more at yeah. school. Yeah. Right, and, and yeah, and to, 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 to Ben's point, like we talk about these three, these three values that we're distilling in this project, one of them. So the example would be like connection is the value and with that like you know swing lens camera if it's something that you have to like 
consistently crank for you know, 30 or 40 seconds, something like that. And it's like being physically involved, um, symbolically involved in like, the, you know, being connected to the camera, to the process. Um, and we ended up steering away from that direction as like, you know, the interaction being symbolic versus like the mm -hmm. experience being um, more tied into those values. But that was like, you know, something that we thought about initially. I guess briefly, like here's another photo from the, uh, the uh, pinhole. And you can wow. see here, there's like no distortion. Like it's crazy. Uh, lots it's of pretty dust, sharp. Though. Yeah, lots of dust. Sorry, I didn't clean that, but I was gonna Photoshop it. You can see <laughs> actually up in the up in the left hand corner, there's a little bit of a like a, a bend. Um, yeah. And that was that was a problem that we had a ton with like kind of pulling that film through that that, that super tight turn. Um, in a lot of the images, we have little like uh, um, artifacts from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of um, sort of uh, cameras that are you know marketed industrially made cameras. We'll use a transport roller when they have mm -hmm. got to go around a tight turn. Yeah. Yeah. And then here, like Ben was talking about earlier, there's, I mean, there were probably 30 cars that drove through this frame while we were taking it and you just can't see any of them, which is, was wild to us. Mm -hmm. um, and in general too, like the resolution is pretty good um, for a pinhole, um, yeah. which is, is surprising and, and super little vignetting too, uh, which we were also surprised about. Yeah. Uh, I guess that brings us to the final camera, I suppose, uh, the prototyping for the final camera. Um, and that was the burst. So the idea, we looked at different ways of like exposing. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to stop you here. This has been bugging me. You guys use the term burst. I think mm -hmm. as photographers commonly use it, a burst is multiple frames one after another on different pieces yeah. of film. I would right. say uh, maybe like, High speed multiple exposure. Uh, mm -hmm. Just, just to clarify for the it's audience, more accurate. Yeah, burst yeah. mode in every camera they own. <laughs> right. So, so the reason that we're calling it a burst is um, sort of for the the audience that it's targeted at people that don't like know cameras. And um, the idea is so this is for the the connection aspect of of the project. And so the idea is that you're like briefly extending the time period over which a photograph is captured. So by overlaying. I think we settled on three, three exposures, three or four. Um, you get a little bit of more of an idea of like the surrounding environment, the energy of a scene um, than you would otherwise. So just kind of explaining what that looks like to to non-camera people is like it's a burst of images on the same frame. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we again we want to put multiple frames onto or multiple images onto a single frame. Um, so we like we're trying to think about ways to do that. Um, Initially, I was thinking we should use the motion cam a motion uh, picture camera so sort of shutter with the disc. I think uh, you mentioned that, but uh, at the time of our call, I was leaning towards what we ended up doing, and that was getting um, uh, autographic like ball bearing shutter cam uh, lens. Mm -hmm. So it's off of like old 1920s uh, uh, Kodak. What is it? <laughs> also, yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't, yeah. wasn't always that warped. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So in order to prototype this, instead of like hacking together, so, oh, the other the other element is we're doing instant film for this camera. So like we wanted to capture like the three main um, like f photographic modes at the current moment, barring for, no for normal people. Yeah, barring four by five. I mean, because it's kind of ridiculous. No offense. Um, so yeah, we prototyped it with this. Uh, with the our or the crown graphic, are we gonna make a whole bunch of enemies with this podcast? Oh well, <laughs> the, with the vitriol in your Twitter feeds becomes no. I think yeah. I think we're all friends here. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, we. Uh, I think initially, like, we got this for the purpose of finding the like proper standoff distance for lenses. Uh, I think we talked about that in the first call we had. Um. But yeah, we like. What's cool about this lens is it doesn't need to be cocked between firing, so you can just fire it like one after another. And I mean, I have a whole box of like fun add a fruit like toys. We we're gonna look at uh, what could be what we could use to like fire that, um, whether it's like a servo or an actuator or something. But um, then COVID happened. Uh, but yeah, 
this uh this guy slots right in and then we did the old dark bag unloading of uh instant film put it into uh a film holder with some sticky tape and then shot the image put it back into the cartridge and processed it in the uh the instant camera in the dark so it wouldn't take a photo so that was super fun um it was definitely a wild process um yeah. and and we have some great pictures of the the crown graphic ne right next to the like little pink um uh instant instax camera that we were using it's pretty funny mm -hmm. um but yeah just the process of like unloading uh carefully a, a single frame of film from the instax cartridge putting it it was actually we had some troubleshooting on like figuring out how to perfectly center that on the um the, the the film plane um for the the crown graphic so that we knew roughly you know when we were setting up the shot where where the image was going to be um and then yeah and then taking that out in a dark bag putting it back into the camera because we didn't you know the only way to evenly expose the the image was to like have the camera do it so it took some experimentation yeah. but just like a funny a funny process to get these results and we can talk more about like what we intended, how we intended to make this one, because this is the furthest away from like the actual camera um, in our like hacking process. But um, yeah, it was like it was super fun to prototype it like that. I mean, it's just like what's the minimum viable way to like get this image? Yeah, uh, I like that you guys start with a lot of uh, prototyping of a process and then building a camera around that process. I certainly right. am working on a bunch of cameras that I have prototype or and building around you know other processes um i've been building a lot of like reversal print stuff to replace giant polaroids mm -hmm. um, but like i don't build the camera first like i spent months getting the process to work with traditional cameras before i start building things for that i, th I think that's the way to go I, I commend you on that i would have liked to see um a camera built that that does this but you know with four months for mm -hmm. You know, it's not not a lot of time. Uh, in four months, I've made maybe half a project. <laughs> yeah, and we're you know we're hoping to get there still. Uh, you know, I, I just recently moved out to San Francisco, and I think hopefully Ben's going to join me out here at some point, and we can uh, unpause this project and when we have <laughs> access to the resources again. What? Not Apple, no. Yeah, um, yeah, I, yeah, I'm I'm working for a, a design studio out here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess we can show some images, but in the yeah, sure. of, okay. You know, right. The description really reminds me of like the early chrono photography, um, or like Duchamp's nude walking down a flight of stairs type of thing. Um, yeah. Or Edward Moybridge accidentally inventing um, right. motion pictures, or mm -hmm. even like I think um, use this technique uh, with like, little lights on. Uh, factory workers hands i think we talked about this mm -hmm. months ago uh to map sort of the movements of fast workers hands mm -hmm. right yeah, yeah. Uh, the astute so, viewers will notice that we pull a lot of these historical uh, photographers in the um the explanation pages for this document so one of the interesting yeah, things for us is that like we we are th there's a deep history that uh we'd like to acknowledge that we're pulling from um, yeah, so you'll see in these images like a variety of um, different like numbers of exposures, um, mm -hmm. sort of us figuring out like what's the, the proper um, exposure for these, you know, are, are we adding all of these up to one exposure or should it be like multiple like full exposures on top of each other and experimenting with that. Mm -hmm. um, and some of these were experimenting with like changing the color of a light in between shots because we had the, you know, we're, we're, we're firing each frame individually. So we kind of had the ability to, um, to, to change things in between um, and abandon sort of that because we knew that that wasn't really honest to the process that mm -hmm. we were trying to prototype. But yeah, sorry, it looks like I'm missing some of these scans. So uh, I'm sure there's more in our document itself. Yeah, here's actually this would be good to to show some of the. Oh yeah, is, yeah. In 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 the hallway of our school, like carrying around this giant crown graphic, and people are walking past us like, "What in the world are they doing?" It's pretty funny. Yeah, and so those are are rather failures uh, that we got initially, but 
um, again, like it, it's kind of hard to think about like what the proper like exposure should be across multiple frames. Um, but I think at the end, like what we want to propose doing uh, and what we would like to do would be um, doing full exposures. So um, or maybe like a third of a stop under or half a stop under, but like um, exposing for the actual scene seemed to give like the most, like the desired results. So I guess moving on, we can talk about like the, um, oh, here, here's a little bit more of the process for the slit scan. Um, we can just kind of quickly flip through these. Um, but as we talked about earlier, like, yeah. A little bit then, uh, that'll be better on video. What? Uh, oh, sorry. Great. Um, yeah, so uh, a lot of the process, like we did a few steps of validation. We tried to like cram that in as much as possible um, in our curriculum or in, within the uh, the like semester we were at school to do this. Um, one of those was handing these to uh, some photographers we knew uh, and seeing like what they thought, like interviewing them, what they thought like the user experience was like. Um, you know, what they thought of the images they were getting versus like their intentions, just trying to like understand how other people who don't know what these things are, but like can pick them up as tools for creativity, uh, like how they approached it. Uh, and then also um, we, uh, on the subreddit, the analog community uh, subreddit, uh, we posted a um, uh, form to try to get a better understanding of like what people just like looking at this might think uh, people who are familiar with photography who might like be in the market to get these, like what they would think of like the different processes and how they might sort in order to validate, like if we we're kind of getting at exactly what we wanted to with like the intentions between the three different processes. And we actually got a ton of responses on this. Like I think we had like 300 some responses on the survey and got a lot of good feedback. Um, some really positive feedback, some incredibly negative feedback. Um, but yeah, it was, um, it was a good learning experience. Read it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I actually, our, my favorite anecdote from, from sharing that was the, the first two um, cameras, uh, the, the slit scan and the burst. There was a, a dude that gave us feedback and was just hated it. He was like, this is not, you know, what you should be doing with cameras. This is like sacrilegious to the film process. And then we get to the I'm last sorry, one. The feedback or this feedback? And what'd you say? Sorry, I, I, you just cut out for a second. Who was giving you this feedback? Oh, uh, uh, just one of the submitted responses. From, yeah, just someone from the Reddit form. Like hated those and then got to the last camera, the pinhole, and he was like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> yeah uh it doesn't entirely matter if we uh run through these like specific quotes the long and short of it is that um we we, we made some tweaks to like how we presented it and um to like it kind of informed us and in the actual design process when we started skidding this and making them like look pretty to, uh so to speak uh some of our choices there were informed by uh the feedback we got in this process um, and then again, like it seemed to sort pretty well to our uh, initial intentions. I guess this graphic, we want to like, explain it really quickly is, um, let's see, uh, the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's basically just comparing um, the, so we kind of give in, in the, the, the uh, survey that we sent out, it was a brief summary of like the process of using the camera and then what the images look like. And then we sort of had people evaluate each of the cameras against the um, three values that we're distilling down to with the hope that the camera that we created to reflect the value matches up in the survey responses with that value. Like, and so people like perceive um, that value as being correlated yeah. to that camera, which from, for the most part it did. Yeah, from one to five, those aren't the number of responses. That's just uh, on a That's, scale. Yeah, it's an average response. Um, but I guess that kind of takes us into the, the making things look pretty element of our discussion here, we, um, which I'm sure render. you'll have, what? Now we get into the sick renders. Yeah, the sick yeah. renders. Here we um, come, Kickstarter. So it, it, sort of an important thing to, to note here is that um, 
Ben and I are industrial designers and we always intended to design this um, and uh, like to make it look pretty to some extent because that's you know what what our job is. Um, we never really intended this to be a render project. We did from the outset. We're like, you know, we're going to build these things. We don't want to show like CGI. We want to, we want these to be real things that people can use and, and understand that way. And because, you know, we lost access to our shop and our tools sort of towards the end of the semester, that didn't end up happening. So it did turn into a render project, but it'll help give you sort of a, an idea of what we mm -hmm. imagine these things looking like. I learned a few things from your renders. Some things I will steal for sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I guess what you're looking at here is just kind of like laying out um, some of the different like directions we were looking at for um, the various uh, cameras. Uh, it was important to us that like there was at least some like form language, something that we were sharing between each three cameras uh, so that they didn't look like out of place together. Um, but it wasn't necessarily like something that we were shooting for as being like uh, like copying and pasting the same elements. Uh, That's actually yeah. something we've talked about on the podcast quite a bit. Um, I don't, I mean, when I'm building things for me or mm -hmm. if I'm building like an industrial machine, like it does not matter one bit what it looks like. No. Um, mm -hmm. But I understand that like when you bring a product to market, right? Like it, it makes sense if somebody can look at your camera and say, oh, that's this brand, right? Um, right. And I, I've kind of come to it um, I don't want to say naturally, but like <clears throat> by reusing certain elements like a lens mm -hmm. uh, across different cameras or reusing production techniques that require billets over chamfers or mm -hmm. different materials or, or certain colors. You know, I think you, you can see any of my cameras now and like, you know, that's, people know what they are, right? The five people on the internet who know what they <laughs> are. But, um, you know, I, I haven't done it in an intentional manner. Um, I think it was like with the Bronco pan, I realized it and started to lean into it. But I wonder mm -hmm. about that, like um, using design language uh, and and like if, I don't know, I, I've never actually gotten to work in like a design studio or, or go to school for such things. Do you guys sit down and say like, okay, these are, these are manly cameras, we want chamfers or um, we want every camera to have this sort of element or material or uh, machining surface or, you know, what what is it? Do, do you make a design decision about how they will look similar, you know, ex yeah. ante or ex post? How's that Absolutely. work? Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, um, should we, I think the best example of this would literally just be going through these next few slides, but maybe you want to wrap up on your point, David. Oh yeah, no, I think that sounds good. Uh, and just yeah. quick before before we move on, sort of Ethan, to your point earlier about um, prototyping the process first, you mm -hmm. can see um, we're we're pretty honed in on general um, uh, package here in these in these in this CAD development. We know how this camera is going to work because we prototype that process first. So I think mm -hmm. that's an interesting point in sort of the development of these forms is they're they're skinned around sort of a general idea of, of how that camera is going to function, which which helped us a lot. Mm -hmm. But yeah, then moving into how exactly we arrived at these forms. And this is something that, this is like the bread and butter of what we do is like, yeah. you know, deciding how something is going to look and why it's going to look like that. I won't say that we're always right, um, but I will <laughs> say that we always have an opinion. <laughs> I have a on, a, on a square surface with one colored part is, uh, I hear like real hot in design in 2020. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I don't even know what the top left image is, but I know that like that's what every new product in 2020 is supposed to look like. Yeah. YouTube. It's all like it's like how can we make brawn but but 20th 21st century? And it's like, yeah. what if we made it colorful? And then that's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Brawn is good. Yeah. So I guess like getting to the point as far as like what we were looking at for this, um, like the why we made some of the decisions um we like we, we'll acknowledge that like cameras are like awesome and always like very technical tools but like um you know like an rb67 it's pretty intimidating right um so we wanted to like celebrate the idea of these as like mechanical tools that get you images uh creative tools but like we wanted to just kind of make them a little bit more approachable um and then as far as like we kind of had an idea of like 
if we were making this, then we knew the materials we could use. Um, so that's like where some of the material choices come into play. Uh, but um, as industrial designers, like what we have to do a lot of the times is like spend hours. This sounds hilarious, but send, spend hours searching for like the right images that convey like an idea when we go to pitch a product to like uh, like a marketer, like a client or something like that. Yeah. And just, I think this is um, sort of the, one of the trickiest parts of the project in general from uh, our industrial design perspective and like fitting it into the parameters of what we do in school because a lot of, or, or in industrial design really in general, so, so much of what we do is like, how do you sell something? Who is this for? Who is it marketed mm -hmm. at? And that has a lot to do with what we choose and in, 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 uh, when it comes to form language and like mm -hmm. styling. Um, and in fact, it's like all of how we choose styling is who's going to be the person buying this. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is tricky and I think uncomfortable a lot of times for industrial designers when we're presenting this project because we don't have a target market. We're not trying to sell this thing in a traditional way. So in terms of like who can use this thing, it's a lot. It's people that are familiar with technical photography. It's people that understand how film works. It's, I mean, these are uh, cameras that use pretty complex processes and it's nice to have some sort of background in film to be able to do that. Um, and so I think that that could justify something that's very technical, like very much in line with cameras that exist already, because these are people that are familiar with that um, from the outset. But we, we don't end up going that way with the form. We, we end up going with something that's much more friendly and much more targeted at an everyday um, user. And really, the reason here is we're not trying to sell an object, we're trying to sell an idea. And so yeah. we want these cameras to be approachable and understandable, and we want them to be um, super simple and convey, um, we want the interaction with them to be simple and we want them to convey sort of um, the idea of what they do really, really easily. Because at the end of the day, we're showing, we're making an argument for, um, uh, for a specific kind of photography and we're trying to sell that idea more so than we are like um, a camera to somebody that's going to use it every day, if that makes sense. Yeah. And if you um, want to get like a little academic with that, this like idea of like using design like products as like a tool for like uh, commentary, like almost in an art sense is uh, yeah, this is discursive design. more of an art school project than an industrial yeah. design project. But that doesn't I don't mean that as a knock. I just, you know, it, it is not something that's going to get made. Uh, maybe yeah. had you guys come along 35 years ago. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it would get <laughs> people would want them. I mean, people will want them, but you know, there's, right. yeah, yeah. And so that was kind of a. I mean, that was a fine line we had to walk all the time, right? Where it's you know we want to be uh, we want to be designing these things, but we don't want to be like selling them necessarily. How do we how do we do something that's a little bit more more art schooly, but then also something that we can build and that is functional, but then also mm -hmm. something that fits into our like pretty specific industrial design curriculum. So it was this was a challenge for sure. One of the things I wonder about is that as manufacturing technology changes um, and everybody, particularly around 3D printing, but also, you know, laser cutting, small scale mm -hmm. injection, things, things people might make at home, as that changes, you know, I want industrial design will also fit towards instead of designing physical products, designing products that, you know, um, I think we're maybe five years away from having commercial um, 3D printers that will embed electronics, right? I think we're maybe 15 years away from the point where I could download a toaster and print the whole thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it sounds ridiculous, but yeah. I mean, I, I got friends working on that technology. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's coming. Um, we, we can already, you know, print circuit traces and uh, hook a six axis robotic arm to drop components into um, a 3D print. And I, I wonder if um, industrial design is going to sort of start pivoting towards maybe even opening up smaller niche products like this that can be produced individually on some machine or technology at home where you wouldn't design for, let's say, uh, a Macy's, which no longer exists, but you would design <laughs> for a Fuse One which mm -hmm. maybe would be in one of 30 households in 2025. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think honestly that plays really well into what a lot of what the premise of this project was, where 
like an iPhone, for example, when it comes to photography is like the most democratized design you can possibly have other than the price point, I suppose. Um, but like in terms of access, something that's manufactured at scale, anybody can mm -hmm. use this. And it's like technology is like 3D printing that allow us to do something that's a lot more niche um, and yeah. add value sort of in a way that something like an iPhone can't, um, which I think is really cool. And, and hopefully um, there's more of an avenue for products like that in the future. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, think it, oh, I was going to say, it's like definitely something that like this community is carving out like the, the homemade like camera community. Oh. It's just kind of like sharing your, your 3d printable files and like, uh, we maybe can't like open up tooling because it costs like a million dollars, but we can share 3D print and like it might not be perfect, but like it can work and it's like super democratized in that way if you have a printer, unfortunately. Yeah. But in some ways, I feel like you know, while you guys skirted what you were supposed to do, and I told you this five months ago by making <laughs> film cameras that would never be made, in some ways, maybe you hit the mark uh, harder than your classmates who made some things that could theoretically be mass marketed, you know, those friends of yours that made toasters and electric right. razor, um, but will probably get made because mm -hmm. you know, we have toaster designers already and they're going off to work at Apple or whatever. Uh, but in some <laughs> ways, your products may wind up making it to market, maybe not through, you know, traditional mm -hmm. means, but um, I'm sure if you put them online, um, on GitHub or something that, you know, um, I just saw an article on Emulsive this morning that popped up that was a time lapse of a guy building a Bronco fan that you know, I didn't know about. It was cool. <laughs> yeah. Cool. You want to go into the design? Uh, um, oh, yeah. Same thing, like looking at different colors. This is like almost more internal work uh, that we're showing in our process book. Uh, so I apologize for the renders that aren't, you know, the crispiest. Uh, but... Renders are 900 million times crispier than any <laughs> anything. That, I never bother to take anything into Blender, you know. It's SolidWorks. Mm -hmm. And then, like, the renders I show are, like, uh, like screenshots of a slicer. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, the, this kind of brings us to the the cameras that we uh, like kind of designed from the architectures that we uh, prototyped and went through earlier. Uh, so this is like the family as a whole, and you can kind of see like a cohesive language that we were talking about. Um, something that we hope feels like kind of friendly, approachable. Uh, we have those like uh, large soft radii. Um, we're trying to stay true to like the actual uh, materials that we would be using. In this case, we we're uh, because we were looking to make these ourselves. Um, we'd be milling the aluminum. Uh, we'd be printing the plastic parts. Um, conceivably, if we were to make this like a little bit larger, we could do some like urethane, uh, like urethane molds for some of these parts. But um, yeah, uh, do you have anything you want to add, David? Yeah, I mean, you'll see um, sort of, we, we touched on it in that slide with all the gray models earlier, sort of the form development. And um, I just want to point out that the, the reason that we arrived at the form that we did is like Ben said, kind of what we have the capacity to build. So mm -hmm. all of these have that like soft shell back, which is actually, it, it's pulled pretty directly from that 3D prototype um, uh, slip scan camera that we had earlier that kind of like clam shells together. Um, and so that's the idea in all of these. Um, it's something that we can easily, you know, flip cut on a CNC mill ourselves. Um, and then all of the all of the other uh, pieces are are three D printed. Whether that's like a resin print, for something that we need in finer mm -hmm. detail, um, or the just normal PLA for some of the like larger touch points. Um, and so that also drives some of the scale of these. Um, it's, it's hard to get a sense here per se, but uh, these are big cameras um, mm -hmm. in general. And that's because they're all, you know, they're not designed to be injection molded. They're designed to be 3D printed and they're designed to have um, off the shelf electronics that we have access to, um, to drive some of the, um, the, the, com the components in there. Uh, so they, uh, uh, another example of how this isn't necessarily like a consumer facing project. This is a, this is designed specifically for us to make um, sort of as a one-off um, version. Mm -hmm. so that maybe answers or partially answers one of my questions that uh, came up is, um, I assume it's the burst camera on the left, the curved yep. plane down front, uh, which mm -hmm. I think is beautiful, uh, really 
nice render and concept. And then it's the um, slit scan in the top right. Um, I don't see a crank, so I assume that that's um, ideally motorized slit yeah. scan. Or mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, did, did you guys model in any of the electronic components, or, or we're just talking? Uh, no, no, it's all there. We, we'll go through the exploded views. Um, kind of explain what we were thinking or what we were hoping again like uh we hope to like actually see these through and i'm sure we'd have to change things because there's still some question marks but yeah um the components I'd are there yeah. yeah it's like 95 percent engineered we worked with um a friend who's a crazy electrical engineer um to do some of uh, that side of things and then you know we have uh sort of all of the space and mounting features all built into here for all the electronics and the components that we need. Um, there's always that like last 5% of engineering that comes from trial and error, putting stuff together, figuring out uh, stuff like that. But yeah, uh, we can go into that. Maybe takes 75% of your time. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, there was something very specific I learned from the curved focal plane pinhole camera. I think if we go through the, the I'll, I'll bring it up when we get to that render. It, it was very, very clever. Yeah, so um, this is the uh, the burst camera. Um, I, I guess we talked about, like, we went really in depth with, like, the prototypes. You kind of understand, like, what you're looking at now, I would hope. But um, in this case, like, it opens with bellows, uh, it shoots uh, the instant film, as we talked about. Uh, you got yeah, your little standard insects cartridge. And is mm -hmm. it fixed? focus um so yes, yes. <laughs> yeah the, the lens itself actually isn't fixed focus but we're just the idea here was to fix it at f16 and just shoot it at a at a uh, mm -hmm. constant constant focus so the bell is just open one line mm -hmm. yeah. right um i mean but if we have rails in there like conceivably like with more engineering and more park counts and probably more tolerances okay. that we couldn't achieve uh, sure. you could, you could get that to focus, but, um, then you run into all those issues with like, all right, are you going to put a range finder on it? Or are you just going to have people guess, um, the, the, the standard problems, I suppose. And speaking of standard problems, I take it, you've got, uh, M3 hex screws on the face of that thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. Button head cap screws. <laughs> what? I, I think they're M3 button head cap screws. I use that forever. It's my favorite screw. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have all the external screws are those uh, M3 hex heads, and then we have a variety of, of other screws on the, mm -hmm. on the internals. And I try to stay true to like the, or we try to stay true to like what the, um, like the, the screw choices should be uh, using pan heads where they should be used, using uh, like, uh, they're blanking my, uh, on me right now, but uh, we can point them out as we go if we want to talk screws. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to talk about screws. But, <laughs> we, can, we can stay a little yeah. more general than that. I just know as mm -hmm. as I recognize them. Yeah, and yeah, so... Go ahead, Ben. I was going to say, um, like, something that we want to, like, celebrate in these cameras is, like, what they are when you open them up. Um, kind of for me, that came from, like, the old, like, looking at Apple products and, like, you open up that MacBook Pro and, I mean, I know you can't change anything in there because everything's soldered down these days, but boy, does it look pretty, right? So, like, being very intentional with, like, what we're showing people when uh, you open up and you, like, uh, interface with the cameras. You can, you can take MacBook Pro apart. I got, two to, I got, I got two MacBook Pros to uh, disassemble this week. <laughs> There's connectors now, but... Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then other things like we were trying to get stuff for free. Like, um, we were hoping to have this, uh, the little like slot, uh, be a point that you could like do, uh, you could push down to release the back. Uh, again, we'd have to prototype this with the given materials to make sure that that's like mm -hmm. reasonable. Um, and then I guess we can get to uh, some of the more technical things on this. Um, what we were hoping to do was take a uh, Instax film camera. Um, and originally we were going to take the rollers only from it, but then when we tore it apart, unfortunately in the process of us both moving, we've lost the actual part, but um, we found that like the gearing and everything can be controlled very easily. Um, and with the help of our friend, we were hoping to uh, utilize the gear trains that are already there and just integrate the internal part of this uh, camera into the, 
uh, burst camera that we created. Um, but you see there, like the like kind yeah, of that, the like, idea of the stack up of the project or the product, right? Move on to the next one. Yeah. yeah oh, so yeah. here, here's here's some some you've seen these already, but. So the long exposure curved focal plane camera, um, again, keeping with the form language, we're hoping to cast the, the front elements there for the like grip points and for these. But um, yeah, just kind of sh staying true to the same, the same ideas as the previous camera, like a little nice little chamfer on the metal parts for like the little deburring and everything. But um, in this yeah. case, it, yeah. This is what I learned from this camera is to put an internal uh, with the film slot coming down and then drop that into a shell. I think mm -hmm. you will see that in a camera dactyl product within the next two years. <laughs> I, think, I mean, it's it's such an obvious and um, I mean, when, when I saw this, like mm -hmm. this one render, when I looked at your project, um, I was looking at the PDF, so I actually didn't see mm -hmm. it moving, but I saw that and I thought like, Okay, I've seen that done before, but it never really occurred to me. And that, like, that is insanely producible. I might add mm -hmm. some transport rollers and and make yeah. it a little bit different. I'm not going to make a curved film plane, but just just taking a block and dropping the film in. Mm -hmm. I have tried. I I have many film back prototypes for mm -hmm. different things that either you know never uh, materialized in terms of the camera that they went to, or they just didn't work themselves. But um, I've tried to like cap them and make them into two pieces and have swing mm -hmm. backs uh, and slide in. But but this piece um, where you have just a solid block where the film drops in and then that sucks back into a case. I thought mm -hmm. if anything, and maybe this is just like my own you know intellectually greedy self, um, the whole project like this this <laughs> one design element makes it worth it. I think a lot of people might use that uh, technique, and I think it's really suitable for 3D printing, either in resin yeah. or... I mean, it all came out of that, like, original prototype we made for this camera. Um, I was about to, like, split everything up to, like, print, and then me and David were looking at it, we're like, I bet we could just, like, just print it. I, and, like, it turned out fine. Like the, So often I can... I draw the thing and then I figure mm -hmm. out how to split it into a million pieces. Mm -hmm. And then often at the end, I will stop uh, after I've printed one that like, I'm trying to fit things together. And one, it's like assembly times mm -hmm. and, and durability. Uh, but also often I will say, how many of these pieces can I actually just get into one block? Mm -hmm. And I right. just did that, you know, really simply, but I, I I can't say enough like that, mm -hmm. that this is very, very clever. And it, yeah. Yeah, I think it would escape anybody who's just looking at it who hasn't tried to do this. Um, oh. But yeah, it's, it's great. I was going to say, um, in this case, uh, just for tolerance sake, um, these were going to be two separate parts. So that like uh, FDM printing and even like uh, the, uh, what's it called? The resin printing, it, your tolerance is on the like that tight of a like interference for uh, the mm -hmm. film transport is like still going to be tiny. So in this case, we yeah. might have to, like split up. But that was an issue we ran into with the prototyping too, where we'd have some slight variation in that sort of focal plane um, track, and then that would like totally like destroy our ability to run the film through it. So yeah, so actually, I'm I'm sitting here with like. What, at least two different like iterations of that one where it's like completely solid film shredding machines i have, yeah. uh, I have really? a box out there in the shop that's uh maybe three different six by twelve uh medium format film holders that go into mm -hmm. a four by five back mm -hmm. and um the best of them are still just film shredding machines yeah, <laughs> yeah. i mean there's I'll get there one day if I have some time to, to work on that project. But um, yeah, that's it's a really tough thing without some pivot rollers. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and then I guess the final camera being the slit scan. Um, again, 
kind of keeping with the form language. In this case, um, the, like loading it, we figured that it would be easier to wind back into the film canister and then like approximate for the like increasing radius of the film. Um, Cause like, if you want a static exposure across all this and same thing with like frame spacing, uh, you kind of run into the problem of like the thing you're winding it onto constantly changing in radius. Um, yeah, pro controller in there. What? Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. I'll tell you how they do it in professional cameras uh, of the nineties is an IR emitter and an IR detector. Placed in yes. the of the that uh, rocket holes. That's 35. I was, okay. I was, that, that was one of our ideas. And I was looking at the, the data sheet for the film to see if like it was, uh, it was sensitive. IR sensitive. To, yeah. Uh, I, I'm sure like, I'm sure it wouldn't work. We were going to test it with um, like the IR thing we could find on Adafruit, but yeah, that was um, that was definitely in the on the table for this. Right. The other that, way to do it's it awesome to hear that though. To make a sprocket wheel that moves, but then the camera has to get yeah. bigger. You have pivot points. You have exactly hand work, and then you've got to measure that thing with a Hall effect sensor or or something. You know, it just yeah. Uh, Which I also uh, bought <laughs> in case yeah, we had to yeah, do that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. and I, I mean, uh, part of part of the thinking too is that potentially this is something that we could just like make sort of a a a, a, a map um, of how the motor speed needs to change over time and just run it on the same map yeah. again and again and probably get pretty close to what yeah. we need. So um, this was definitely like minimum viable product. Are we talking uh, stepper motor or continuous DC motor? Um, that is a good question because I cannot remember anymore so, which one of the ones of it, in relation to a 35 millimeter film can. Mm -hmm. I think it would be very hard for you without a servo or a stepper to uh, accurately position uh, yeah. a certain number of turns with a small DC motor because that right. motor is going to change uh, its properties over time. Yeah, I've got it here. Um, oh, it is, uh, it's a stepper motor. Yeah, it's a stepper motor. And um, I was hoping to use a gear reduction to like decrease the, um, like or to increase the resolution sure. of the, the steps. Um, yeah, we were a little I bit afraid of like getting some striation in the, in yeah. the film. This, because of the this one has some like stupid high like rotational accuracy for each mm -hmm. step. So, um, yeah, that that was the idea there. Um, Maybe the other day we can talk stepper motor controllers and micro stepping. But that's that's a little bit uh, intense for right now in the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, we were doing this with the oversight of our like. I, I can't stress enough. Like this kid's just wild. Uh, I don't know if we can like describe what he does because I think he's still like trying to pitch this as a project. He's like. Definitely like innovator, crazy, uh, like electrical engineer, coder type. Um, like he he was writing his own codec for like uh, encoding video to for his like product. It was like nuts. Uh, yeah, so this is like no skin off his back. Just it's like oh yeah, just run this. Um, anyway, it would wind. We we were hoping to wind the whole entire film into that like uh, onto the other side of the camera and then wind into the. Um, canister and so like oh, that's like, that, that. yeah that's what this this uh wheels for there is so that you can wind it and then again that gives you visual feedback if like you're actually using the camera or not um and i was hoping to get like a double like uh i was hoping to rely on the like shutter button to be depressed all the way um for you to open up the back so that as like the indexing indexing mechanism mm -hmm. um and then the same sort of like battery compartments that we've carried along all these very clever. Yeah, so that was where we ended up for this. And mm -hmm. so Ben and I have talked a little bit um, sort of in the time since then. Yeah, here are some of the, the um, this uh, this top photo was in the shop where we were doing some of the electronics. Um, so you can see like soldering tools and stuff back there. Um, but yeah, we, we've talked a little bit since um, this project has wrapped up about you know where we want to take it going forward. And obviously we came pretty close to being able to like start building these things um, and like final materials, see what happens, figure out some of the you know, problem, problem solve some of the uh, the sticking points that we, we still know that we would have. 
Um, but I, I think also potentially a, a viable way to push this project forward is to go step backwards a little bit and maybe get rid of some of the electronic uh, elements and go back to like that hand crank photo or that hand crank mm -hmm. camera or some of like our original prototype of the long exposure and just make those a little bit nicer um, and, and, uh, and kind of refine that CAD and interaction um, and, and see where that goes. Cause I think that can be really interesting too. You know, as, as much as I've learned from looking at your renderings um, in terms of what I think is, you know, and I am no businessman, like I sell mm -hmm. weird cameras on the internet to eight <laughs> But um, I think the one that, like, out of all of this that I think, like, immediately, even if you sold it as it is or, or mm -hmm. get the files, however, or sold the files, however you do it, I think there's a, an immediate market, however you do it, uh, for the hand crank slit scan camera. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of new. It's different. It's small. Uh, it, it's cute. I think, like... You know, is it going to be the camera that people use every day? Probably no. But would I run a roll or two through it one day for fun? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I probably don't know anybody who shoots film who wouldn't want to shoot a couple rolls yeah. with, with such a camera. Right. And it takes like no filament either. Like it's so tiny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, we're excited to see, you know, once we kind of get back into the swing of this project to see where we can take it um, and and sort of round off this experience. We had to, we had to bring it to a close so that we could graduate. Uh, and, and have an online graduation. We did, yeah. We graduated, graduated from my couch uh, at my childhood home in Indiana. It was absolutely everything that I wanted my college graduation mm -hmm. to be and more. But, they, yeah. just, they just did a makeup commencement that I won't complain about our school. Anyway, it was just a scrolling, uh, a slideshow of like names uh, <laughs> yesterday. Sounds uh, like uh, fun to attend. Hey, so, you know, normally when, when we kind of like do the last segment in the show, mm -hmm. we like to ask, you know, what do you have on tap now? Where do you see yourself, you know, camera making in the future? Um, I'd like to kind of mix that up a little bit. You know, um, I think both of you are starting new jobs as, as uh, you know, young young adults, um, probably there's not uh, much money in uh, camera design for design firms. Uh, that's kind of something you gotta do on your own uh, these days. But Leica had an intern or an internship posted. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Yeah, you, you should go do that. I'm gonna compete with you for the Leica internship. Um, yeah. I. I I got a friend uh, who interned for Hasselblad. Like, uh, they're they're still out there, right? Um, yeah. Those tend to be electrical or uh, mechanical yeah. engineering type of things, but I'm sure they have designers. Like I watched that documentary with um, the GFX 100 from Fuji, mm -hmm. and like they had a huge design studio working on that. And that's interesting, but um, certainly not making analog film cameras. And I assume that you guys will wind up making watches and coffee makers and maybe some cars. And, um, you know, I, I'm curious to see where your careers go in the next 20 years. I will be watching. But um, in terms of, like, cameras, um, do you see it as, as um, finishing this project uh, in your spare time or, you know, continuing on? I shouldn't say finishing. It's finished. Mm -hmm. It's got a degree. But um, do you see yourself building other cameras uh, individually or together? Or where, where do you see camera making going for either of you in the next year or two? Um, I think we, we want to see this project out for sure. Um, it's kind of, it's been on pause for a second, but um, I think we, we have to discuss exactly like which direction we want to take it like we were just talking about. Um, but I mean, personally, well, when I when I get a little bit more free time, I have some ideas of like cameras I wouldn't mind like trying to prototype. Um, hey, real quick, but, can you kill yeah. kill your screen share. Oh yeah. Sorry, I've just been staring at my screen the whole entire time. I have no clue what you guys have been doing. Um, I know it's mostly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, but nothing, nothing fully cooked. Um, I don't know about you, David. Yeah. I mean, 
I'm actually, believe it or not, I'm working at a camera company. Um, so I just, I, I just started a job at, um, it's called Vercata. They're a startup and they do like security solutions. Um, and so I design security cameras now. Um, not exactly the same, but it is, it is in the same world. Um, there's lots of new exciting stuff going on there. They're big into like, uh, comp computer vision kind of stuff. Um, so, I mean, I just started this past week, so, you know, we'll see what happens. Lots of exciting stuff, uh, that I can't necessarily talk about, but, um, yeah, it should, it should be good. And, and after all, I, I, I did end up at a camera company. So, um, in terms of like making cameras. Uh, this is like I mentioned before, sort of my first venture into um, into that world. Uh, I think for both of us, definitely photography is going to be always be uh, an important hobby and pastime. I think um, I, I, I won't speak for Ben, but part of the reason that I got so into photography is because it runs really parallel to what we do in, in industrial design um, in terms of, you know, um, working with light and composition and color, but then also like just as a general creative outlet. Um, but it's like so, so different uh, in terms of execution from what we do in industrial design that it's like, it's a nice way to sort of do the things that I love to do in a format that's not the same as what I'm doing all day, every single day. So I think that'll definitely stay um, a part of, of my life moving forward. I don't know. I mean, I feel like to some extent, the uh, the building side of cameras is maybe a little too close to home with industrial design. So mm -hmm. I'll have to find, you know, for me personally, I have to find what that balance is moving forward. Um, it's certainly a process that I enjoy. I love building things. Uh, I think it just kind of comes comes down to um, whether I have the energy to put into doing that when it's something that I'm kind of already doing all day, every day. Um, so yeah. I have a feeling you won't be able to help yourselves. Um, <laughs> Probably not. One of my favorite uh, previous interviews was with this guy, Graham Houghton, uh, who's at Chicken Thumbs. I don't know if you guys have found him, but he's, you know, a professional industrial designer for, you know, most of my lifetime. And he's made everything from like uh, chairs and furniture to uh, deodorant uh, containers and he makes just amazing uh, pinhole cameras in his spare time, like really kind of floors me. Um, <laughs> I think at some point, uh, I, may, maybe you've had enough of it after doing that full time for four months. Certainly I uh, come to that feeling quite often, but um, you know, you're going to be making things every day and mm -hmm. taking pictures. Like there's only so long you can hold out. <laughs> mm -hmm. I will, I will say there's nothing quite like the feeling of like putting together a prototyping and a, putting together a prototype, going out and using it and like it working. Um, like, yeah. you know, building when something from those, scratch that works. Yeah, when well, we pulled the negatives out of the bank. <laughs> True. Yeah. Yeah, I was yeah that, that feeling of pull, yeah, me pulling this let's scan photos out of the tank and being like, whoa, like it worked <laughs> and it was so much cooler than we thought it was gonna be. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Hey Ben, how about you? Um, As far as like, making cameras i think first i'm probably going to be what yeah yeah um yeah first i guess would be the focus would be like figuring out what we want to do with this but um i have all sorts of things like i want to like adapt for the rb67 um definitely want to look into like uh, breaking another instax camera and figuring out how to slap it on the back um but yeah nothing nothing fully baked Okay. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about, uh, either about this project or that you just really got to get off your chest onto uh, YouTube for 300 people um, that you'd like to talk about? I, I'll give a one thing that I want to say that I, I feel like we didn't quite conclude on just in, in terms of this project. Um, it was certainly a learning experience. And um, I think kind of the coolest takeaway for us from this was uh, we mentioned this at the beginning, there was always this battle of like simplicity versus complexity and what adds value and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And we kind of came into this whole process of like, we're going to make things that are more complex because they add depth of experience, they add value in a unique way. Um, mm -hmm. But then I think what is funny that we realized sort of at the end of this project was at the end of the day, we designed cameras with like a really simple user experience. 
So mm -hmm. like the process of using the camera was complicated in a way that we saw added value, but like the way that you interacted with that camera was super simple. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think really the, the, the biggest learning um, opportunity for us in this project was sort of understanding when it makes sense for, for things to be simple, when it makes sense for, for things to be complicated. And really as, as a designer and a camera maker and a photographer, it's about sort of this idea of um, crafting, crafting attention and, and really being intentional on where, where you're putting your attention and where you're um, uh, advocating other people put theirs. Mm -hmm. Hey, Ben and David, where can people, and we'll put the links in the description below, but um, where can people find you and where can people find your projects on the internet? If there's any shout outs or things you want to plug, now's a great time to do so. Go for it, Ben. Yeah. All right. Um, so you can find uh, my industrial design work at benhoffman.design uh, on the World Wide Web. And there should be some links to interesting resources that I like to host up there. Um, and then I guess on the, the social, um, my design account, uh, similarly named is benhoffman.design on Instagram. And then uh, I like to throw up some things I shoot on a more, I guess, personal account. Uh, and that would be Ben Hoffman or B Hoffman 330 uh, also on Instagram. Yeah. And you can find my industrial design portfolio at davidmiller.id. Um, just like Ben, my Instagram handle for industrial design is exactly the same, davidmiller.id. And you can also find some of my photo work at um, the DM photo, T H E D M P H O T O. Um, yeah, and you can find a link to this project presentation and the process book that we sort of went through on either of our websites. Um, Well, thank you guys very much for being on the Homemade Camera Podcast and talking to me for so long. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you.